I get her name correct, thanks to Alicia, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you all for providing me this opportunity. And um, uh, you know, it, is, it is a great honor to speak in front of you. But before I begin, I would like to say a very special thank you to Rakesh and Rashmi for this opportunity. And I also want to thank my wife, Gita, who is obviously in the audience. You've seen her without whom I could not be here today. A lot of my success is attributed to her, not to me, uh, even though I take center stage today. So, uh, so just talking about myself and entrepreneurship, uh, for me, entrepreneurship is, is, is a little bit more than just, um, just a word. It is a belief. It is something that you live for. It is something that you dream. And um, how does it how does it come about? And you know, I, I'm going to go back and give you guys a little bit of my life as my first story to help you see that journey for me. And I'm going to talk about a few other stories um, that highlight uh, what an entrepreneur does mean or live like. Um, and and. I've known Rakesh for, I don't know, 40 years, something like that, uh, and Rashmi for almost the same time. But um, And they know that I'm not your typical individual. I'm, I'm a guy who was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was raised in a very uh, above middle class family in a small town, Ajmer, Rajasthan. And um, in fact, I tell, even today I tell people that when I was growing up, I think I was the only 10 year old who used to drive. And obviously when you're 10 years old, anybody can tell you're underage. But no police officer could stop and give me a ticket because he was worried about getting fired, losing his job, versus giving me a ticket. So that's the environment I grew up in. So I'm not your typical entrepreneur that a lot of times comes from either a very famous college dropout or, or you know, I, I haven't done any of those things. Uh, I'm just a very simple person, grew up in a small town um, and, and uh, just worked very hard to make it happen, uh, to, to build on my dreams, to build on what I knew I could accomplish. And uh, So my journey starts with what I just described to you about being the son of a you know, very well-to-do family. With, with everything that I ever wanted in my life. And um, to get up and go with my wife and my mother to Alaska, of all places. So imagine living in Rajasthan where the temperature is about 100 or so, 110 degrees in the summer. And uh, I moved to Alaska where when we got out of the airport, it was about, uh, I'm thinking it's Fahrenheit, but it's about like you know, 10 degrees. Uh, Celsius, right? So it's a hundred degree drop in temperature, and uh, we didn't even know how to react. We just had to open our suitcases, pull out our jackets, so we could get warm. And yes, we did take a lot of stuff with us, but really, what I had done is I left everything I had all my friends, all my family, other than my mom and my wife. And we ended up in Alaska with five dollars in our pocket. Now, back then, if you you guys aren't old enough to know those times when there's immense restrictions on foreign exchange and stuff. So you could only leave with $20 a person. And so by the time we, we had our stop over in Narita and we had to buy some tea and coffee and stuff, by the time we ended up in Anchorage, we had $5 left. And where do you go from there? I mean, how many of you have five rupees in your pocket right now? Most of us have a lot more than that in our pocket right now. And, uh, but imagine, and not knowing anybody. Yes, I had a brother there and things, but not really knowing anybody. I didn't have any friends. I mean, I give you the example where even the, the guy on the street corner knew me. He knew who I was. And I have lots and lots of incidents, instances that I can talk about where somebody walks up to you and says, oh, you are the so-and-so's family, correct? And you end up there where nobody knows you. So it was, it was very revealing for me. And one of the things I realized quickly, and I know you guys are here focused on education. So when I got to Alaska, uh, I knew that I had to get a local degree. Without the local degree, I would not be recognized. So I have, 
I have a master's in economics from India. I go there and nobody cares. They don't recognize it. They don't treat it like you have a degree. So I went to college. Within seven days of my landing in Alaska, I was actually enrolled in college. And why, why was that important? The reason I always thought is, look, when I was growing up in India, I had everything. I didn't need to worry about a thing. Life was very, very cool, very full of everything I wanted. But you end up in a foreign country. And remember, nobody immigrates just to become a failure someplace else. We immigrate to succeed. And I always started to think about it as failure is not an option. And you have to live that. Because if you don't live it, then you're OK that you fell and broke your leg. Yeah, it's a failure. Who cares? Life happens. No, but you have to live differently. And you have to believe that failure is not an option. If you want to succeed, if you want to become something. I did not coin that term for a very long time. But once I got there, that was the thing that I lived. So every day I went to school, it was about success. I got to get A's. I got to graduate at the top of my class. I used to sit in the third or fourth row in the class when I was in school in, in India. I get to US, I used to sit in the first row. I would always have my hand up. I would take 12 credits, or about four classes was considered full time. And because I was paying out of state tuition, I was not a resident at that point. And the university allowed me to take anything over 12 for free. I enrolled in 18, 20 credits. Because you got to leverage it. Right? You got to make a success out of it. And you have so much, so little time because life is uncertain. Typically, life is short. I am about twice the age of the average person in here, but it's still short. You never know what's going to happen. And so, what you're doing is you're capitalizing on every resource that you have available. And that is thinking like an entrepreneur, even though I did not consider myself an entrepreneur back then. I was just a student, I was just trying to make a living, I was just trying to get ahead. I had a part-time job that paid, and I had to obviously make money to pay for my way through college, to pay for um, um, my food and living and all that stuff. In fact, one of the classes I enrolled in was an English class, and it required me to buy 15 different books, because obviously in English you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of writing. And each book was about $40. So that's 15 times 40 is about $600 just for books. I actually dropped out because I could not afford to buy 15 books. I actually had to drop the class. And so, you see, you have to make it work for you. And the one other thing is, when you are working hard, and some famous guy said this, I don't know who it was, I've seen it. Attributed to many famous people, but the harder I work, the luckier I am. It is not about luck. We are obviously Indian. We believe in fate, correct? All of us here should believe in fate. Uh, all of us are Hindus. All of us, you know, it's, we live that all our life. But fate can be changed by hard work, and you are in control of your fate not somebody else. Don't let somebody else run your life. One of my mentors at one time told me that there's a company called Raghu Bhargava Inc. And there's only one person that watches out for that company. And that person's name is in the title of that company, Raghu Bhargava. Nobody watches out for you like you do. And so how do you make it happen? You do not put your faith in the hands of somebody else. Yes, we go to temple and yes, we pray for the best outcome in our life. We do the same thing even in the US. But we go home and go to the office and we work harder than the average person. We work smarter than the average person to get ahead. So I'm going to fast forward and I'm going to get on to my second story. And this story starts with failures, starts with setbacks. Because whether we are a young little kid or uh, somebody at my age or maybe even older, we've all seen setbacks, we've all seen failures, we've all seen 
things happen in our life where we did not succeed or the outcome wasn't what we were hoping for. One of our clients, they represented about 90% of our revenue, called and said, look, we want to move in a different direction and we're going to terminate your contract. Now imagine any company using 90% of the revenue with a small note, short notice period. That is not very good at any point in your life. It's like imagine 90% of your wages going away. I don't care how much you make, whether it's $1 a day or $1 million a day. Imagine 90% of it going away all of a sudden. Well, we can't survive on that. And that's what happened to Global Upside. And that is when uh, Gita, who's a co-founder, my wife, she brought me in and said, hey, look, I need you to come in and pick this up. Now you think about it, that this is sort of a near-death experience for a company, and how does stepping in at that point help? Because you're thinking like, oh man, I'm walking into a failure. I'm walking into something that's gonna die here in a few months, because we've lost everything. But, but that is where an entrepreneur shines. And again, I still did not think of myself as an entrepreneur yet. I still am thinking about some guy who needs to succeed. Some guy for whom failure is not an option. Some guy who believes, in, and, and uh, Vidisha talked about this, that impossible is not in our vocabulary. That is what we live by. Because what we have to do is, in this phase of adversity, we have to succeed. Because we can give up any time, but the minute we give up, we should take a gun and shoot ourselves in the head. Because we don't deserve to live. And you guys are committing to that. You are focused on your education. You are spending time here at the university, uh, two years to get a degree. And this degree will eventually mean a lot for you guys. Smoke in the air is, <laughs> is getting to me. Sorry about that. So this is, again, a second time in my life where what I'm doing is, first I moved from India, giving up my cozy life to the US. Now I'm back in that position where I'm giving up my day job and I'm gonna uh, go work for a company that is near death, right? And I'm gonna turn it around. And how do you do that? And I lived by a few rules back then in my early years of Global Upside. The first was, I had to have a regimen. My regimen was that I needed to have three meetings a day. One about 10 o'clock, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, one around lunch hour, and one around 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And my take was, if I talk to three people a day, sit down face to face, spend some time with them, and I tell them what we do. I'm not trying to tell, sell them anything. I, I actually look back at those years and I, I always call that those, those times in my life as, event, um, as being an evangelist. Now, I don't know if you guys know the word evangelist really, if you look up in the dictionary it means preaching religion. And I'm not preaching religion. I'm a tiny bit of a religious person. My wife is the more religious in our family. But uh, the way I think about evangelism is not necessarily preaching about God but preaching about what your belief is. And if you can convince somebody else that you know the answers, that you can help them, then when they need help, they will come back to you. And even though for the last two, three years I have not been doing sales, I still sitting in my desk get leads. My closure rate on these leads is about 90%. Because these people know when they call me, that we can actually help them, we can solve their problem. And so three meetings a day was my regimen and evangelism. Not selling. I'm not trying to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm here, I'll buy you lunch if you sign this piece of paper or buy some services from me. No. And above all, in this evangelism and these meetings, what I was doing was, I was telling people, I was actually showing it to them, you can't tell people this, you have to show it to them, that you care about them. And how do you show that you care about them? You focus on them. You, last night I had dinner with Rakesh and Rashmi, 
And my questions to them was, hey, I haven't seen you in about 20 years. Tell me about your journey in the last 20 years. Because last time I saw him, he was not a professor. He was doing something completely different. And there were stories that were coming out from our early years that I had forgotten. And how would I remember those? Obviously, they were stuck in their heads. And if you open up, if you ask that question, if you focus on them, they will bring those things to the table. And that allows you to reestablish that bond that wasn't quite broken for 20 years, but wasn't being renewed every year or every day because you were seeing each other all the time. And, and, and that's how you have to show people that you actually care about them. And once you show them that, they care, that you care about them, and if they believe you, then they come back to you. Because don't we all want support, whether it's in doing our homework, whether it's, hey, my bike is broken or I have a flag, can somebody take me to school with them on the bike or something like that. And these are small little things on a daily basis that may happen, but there's a lot more big things that happen in life where you need help. And everybody needs help. Hey, I'm a CEO of, uh, and, and the, name, the, the name that has been mentioned here many times is Global Upside, but I'm the CEO of three different companies and we're launching another one that will uh, go live in, in uh, Q1 in January. So how did I go from being just a happy-go-lucky person in, in India to being the CEO of four companies? Uh, it's just help from lots and lots of people across various facets of life. The one story I do want to talk about is in this uh, in this evangelism phase, in this um, convincing phase, somebody introduced me to what happened to me, happens to be now a client of ours for about 10 years. And this guy, I sent him an email, and I was introduced by email, and my philosophy was I would never pick up the phone if I was introduced by email, or if I, if I was introduced by phone, then I would never send an email to that person till business necessitated that. So I started sending them emails and he would say, yeah, yeah, let's set up a time and meet out or something like that. And then the day before or something, he would call and cancel or he would email me and say, hey, can we move it out another two weeks? So on and so forth. About three months, for three months, this went back and forth. Finally, I showed up in his office. He made time. We sat down and we started talking. And towards the end of the conversation, he asked me, he said, do you know why you're sitting here today? I said, yes, I think you have a need and I'm here to help you figure out how to solve it. He said, no, you're not here because I have a need. You are here because you never gave up. You never gave up in spite of my pushing you out for three straight months for every two weeks. So that's what, uh, about six, seven times that he had pushed me out. And people do not, I mean, we face criticism. We face negativity. We face rejection in our life all the time. You go up to a girl, you want to talk to her, and she says no. Well, that's rejection. How many times are you going to do it before it changes the outcome? Most of us will never do it again, at least not with that girl. Or sometimes we get a bad grade in class. Well, you won't get to the next grade, so you have to take the read, take the exam, or things like that. But a lot of us, uh, we may never do it if it wasn't forced upon us. But that is what an entrepreneur does. You push yourself in the face of adversity. You push yourself when there is a rejection. You push yourself for people to see your point of view. Because yes, you have invented the next best mousetrap or the, you know, whatever, uh, you know, proverb you want to use to define it. But you have to push. Because remember, you're the only one who's watching out for yourself. And especially back then, we were a very, very tiny company. There was Gita and me in the US, and we had about 10 people in, the, in India. So it was a 12 person company. I and mean, we could fold if one of our clients left. We could fold if we did not win more. And, and it is a very, very, especially if our future is tied into it. Because the company folds. What do you go tell people? I'm out of a job because my company folded. I mean, how would you face the world to tell them that? And it drives you, it motivates you to success.
So we've talked about my childhood a little bit. We've talked about setbacks. What, what is common in both of those? Well, obviously I am the common factor, but what you bring to the table as a common factor is what I call attitude. And attitude is, is something that defines you as an individual. And why is that important? Because a lot of us are really used to saying no. In fact, I just read a joke on WhatsApp yesterday uh, while I was on the train coming here. Um, the guy calls his friend, oh, hi, Rakesh. Rakesh is, hi, Raghu, how's life? And he's like, oh, I have a, something I would like to get help on. And he's like, yeah, Rakesh says, so why don't you get on with getting help and hangs up? I mean, that's, that's like, really? But why, why would I take on your problems? And I understand that. Because my problems are my problems, not yours. And it is for me to convince you somehow that my problems are a shake on your problems. But it is very easy to convince somebody else that you are willing to take on their problems. If Rakesh calls me and I say, yeah, tell me about your problem. Or if I call him and he says, Take, tell me about your problem or your challenge. It changes the outcome of that conversation, even if Rakesh or I don't know how to help each other. Even if we do not know what the right answer is. And I call, at Global Upside we have an attitude. Our attitude is, when we're sitting on a conference table, we're sitting like this, and if you guys can see the visual, our hand is up at all times. Why is our hand up at all times? Because we're the yes person. We're the yes, we're the people that say yes the most. So let me give you an example of what that translates into. So about a year ago, actually it was started in about July last year, uh, summer of, uh, summer of uh, 16. We were engaged by a client and we had signed a contract, we'd done everything necessary from a legal contractual perspective and we were going to bill them about $7,000 a month. So that's about a $100,000 contract if you look at it on an annual basis. Which, you know, it's a not a bad contract, but it's not a big deal. I mean, we do much larger deals all the time. So, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, life is going to go on. But as we started to attend some conference calls on the work we had actually picked up for that $7,000 a month, we realized we realized that the client actually needed a lot more help. And the first time we sent an invoice, which was for the month of September, you will not believe that we had done over 10,000 hours of work for them in the month of September. 10,000 hours of work. I mean from $7,000 to 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is five man years. Uh, uh, you know, five people working for a year full time. And that's over a million dollars that we had built them in that first month. <coughs> How do you get from 7,000 to 1 million plus? It's an attitude. And yes, there were things they were asking us to do, or there were things we were raising our hand for that we did not even know how to solve. I know one of the people in the audience, one of the professors is an HR, uh, you, you teach HR in, in GHS, right? We built an HR team for this client of 50 people to deliver HR services in 40 countries for 5,000 employees from scratch. We had nobody on our payroll that knew HR other than one person, but that was a, one person couldn't do 5,000 people with HR. We built a team of 50 people in less than two months. In fact, I was here on one of my trips and I went around and I gathered all of the new HR team members uh, and I said, look, I just want you to give me three things. Your name, the company you're coming from 
and how long have you been at your outside? And there was about, at that point there was about 25 or 28 people in the, in the room. And the average, now this is not a statistical average, but it was an average based on just what they were telling me. The average tenure of this, this person at Global Upside was about 10 days. We had, we had 25 people, the average of which was only 10 days at Global Upside. Now some of these were very, very senior people. We actually had hired somebody from HCL, and this person was running a 125,000 employee company as the head of HR on a particular side of their business. We had that kind of talent on our payroll within an average of 10 days. How do you do it? Yes, you have to put a lot of hard labor. You, it is not about that. It is about the attitude, about believing that you can do it, about knowing, having confidence in yourself. And it is all about attitude, the one word I like to use. Because if he had said, no man, we don't know how to build this team, or we think it's going to be very hard to build the team, or 700 other excuses, maybe 7 million other excuses, we would never get there. Because it's not our problem that the client needs help. If you don't believe we can do it, go find somebody else. But we had the attitude of an entrepreneur. And at this point, so about four years ago, five years ago is when I really thought of, started thinking of myself as an entrepreneur. Right? And I'm thinking about cracking the code, so to speak. I'm thinking about how do you solve the problem of each and every client, each and every person that you run into. Obviously, we have a domain in that respect, right? We're not solving every problem. We're not, as an example, a marriage counselor. So we can't really help with that. But there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And, and that changed the outcome for Global Upside. That changed the outcome for each and every member of this team. And, and the, I'm going to read this, this line I wrote here. It is never about what you know, but what you can deliver based on the right team. And remember, I've talked about having a support structure. Having people that can help you succeed. Even the Prime Minister of this country has a cabinet. He cannot run this country on his own. Right or wrong, he cannot run it on his own. So he has, prime, uh, he has a cabinet. The cabinet has their own secretaries and undersecretaries and so on and so forth. I mean, how many people are employed by the government of India? Rakesh, do you know the answer? Approximately? 5 million people, 10 million people, something like that, correct? There's only one Prime Minister, but he has about 10 million people, pick a number, working for him to run this country. Because he cannot do it by himself. There's no one person can do it. And so you, it is all about the team and the attitude that you instill in them. That we can do it, we can figure it out, we can go find the right talent when we don't know the answer, and we can make it happen. And that is what entrepreneurs do. Because even if you had the smartest idea on some new software, some new product, I mean, I have an iPhone sitting there, and 10 years ago, today, this year is the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. 10 years ago, we did not even know that something like that would exist. We had no idea what to do with it when it came out. We didn't know what to do. Today, we cannot live without one of those. Does any, anybody in this room who does not have a phone, a smartphone, I don't see any hands going up. Come on, raise your hand if somebody doesn't have a, a smartphone. Okay, maybe I should ask the other question. How many do, do you have a smartphone? There you go, see? Can any one of you live without one? So some entrepreneur out there thought he could come up with an idea, or he had an idea to come with a product that we cannot live without today. But how do you make it happen? Because there was only one Steve Jobs. And he had to have, I don't know how many thousands of people working on it to make it happen. But eventually, his attitude made the iPhone what it is today. And I don't know if you know the story, I'm going to tell a little story about uh, the iPhone, which really isn't anything to any credit that I can take. But um, when the iPhone was first designed 10 years ago, it, it was made out of plastic. 
And the reason it was made out of plastic is because plastic is lighter than glass. Now today we all know that the front of the iPhone is, is glass, right? And you drop it, it breaks all the time, so it costs a lot of money to fix it, all that stuff. And so plastic was more durable, would not break and stuff. Except then Steve Jobs was, uh, was uh, doing what he did on a daily basis with the iPhone in his pocket, uh, in his pen pocket, and his set of car keys in his pen pocket. And so what happens when you have two things in your pocket, they rub with each other. And the keys left scratches on the front of the phone. And two weeks before the launch of the iPhone, he said, we cannot do this. We have to change the front end. And we have to make it of a material that will not scratch as easily. That's when they put glass. Two weeks before the launch, they changed the product. Somebody had the right attitude. And I don't know if any of you have seen the movie on uh, Steve Jobs, but um, in one, and there's two movies made on Steve Jobs. One of them, which I have seen, I don't remember the name right now, but uh, they're asking him to, Steve Wozniak, which was his partner, is asking Steve Jobs to push the launch by 10 minutes so they can reboot the computer and show the demo better. And Steve Jobs says no. We are a computer company and we start on time. Because computers do not take a break, they do not fail, they do not, they just, everything happens like clockwork. So today we started about 10 minutes late. In fact, and I speak a lot all the time, guys. A lot both in volume and quantity. <laughs> but at least once a month I'm doing a seminar, a webinar, or, or, or something like this, um, maybe at home and maybe in India, maybe other countries across the world. I always start on time. Because you guys all showed up on time, did you not? Nobody came in after we walked in the door. I was the last person in. I should have been the first person in. I actually show up, I was here about half an hour before the start time. I cannot afford to be late to show respect to other people. That you made commitment to come listen to me, I have to make the commitment to show up on time and do it. And this is when I look at the watch and say, okay, I still have about 15 minutes left. So that leads me to the final story that I want to talk about. And this is what I call a 100-year vision. So what I am trying to build at Global Upside is not a company that can do extremely well today. We capitalize on it and we sell it and we go home, which is what a lot of entrepreneurs do. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's a difference in opinion is all it is. What I'm trying to build is a 100-year company. Why a 100-year company? I care about the longevity. I care about the mark I'm leaving on this planet. And to use the term that Rakesh brought up in his introduction is use the minimum resources possible, have the maximum impact. Every time a company gets acquired, there is a, some level, level of negativity around it. And personally, I've been in, involved in over two dozen acquisitions from a consultant prospect, auditor perspective, from a controller, CFO, a consultant, CEO, every perspective that you can think of. And when you do over two dozen of these acquisitions in the last 20 years, you realize how much value is being created and how much value is being destroyed. And so it is extremely important to focus on that and build something. So wh why, why do you think Google and Facebook are so successful? They are not focused on today. Google spends billions of dollars every year on research. There's a lot of companies that are doing research on um, um, you know, the hybrid cars or all electric cars or, or self-driving cars. And I don't know how many billions of it goes waste every year in some respect. But that one guy who cracks that code is going to change the life of our, all of us. So I have a car that is partially self-driving. It's not fully self-driving, but partially self-driving. And, and those of you, well, two, three of you know that I'm an extremely fast driver. 
I am one of those guys that have driven like 150 miles an hour. That's what race car drivers do on a, on a race course. I've done it on a highway. Okay. What's 150? So that's what, uh, about 250 kilometers an hour, something like that. Um, one of you can do the math much better than that, than me. But this car will make sure that I do not die if I'm going 150 miles an hour. And we are all willing to pay for it, correct? Because I want to live. None of you want to die either, correct? Today is not the last day of our life, other than if God wishes that. But, so you have to think about a very long term. And when you think of the very long term, you think of what you, of a hundred year company. And that is what we're trying to build at Global Upside. So I know that I won't be around for a hundred years, most of us won't be around in a hundred years from today, but whoever is around will remember us, remember what we did, remember what we built, and that is our legacy. You, you see the name on the, on the top line here. Why do we remember this guy? Why did we name an institute after him? Because he didn't think, let's just do this today and let's move on. Whatever his invention, whatever his entrepreneur spirit led him to do, he could have sold it and, and uh, moved on. And nobody would know who this person is, you know, today, right? But today we are sitting here in an institute that is named after him, only because he had that 100-year vision. And real leaders actually have a 100-year vision. They don't have this vision of how do we make this. And obviously we do need to make money today because we do need to pay our bills. We need to make a success story every single day, but not by sacrificing the long-term success. Part of the 100-year vision is also giving back to the community. And we all find different ways to do it. Some people do it by you know, going to the temple and offering 100 rupees, or going to Tirupati offering a million dollar donation, or whatever it is that you feel like you should do from your belief perspective. I believe in education. The reason I'm here is not just because Rakesh invited me to speak here today, but I'm here because I care about education even more than I care about global upside. And that is reflected in, in my life from my childhood. And this is something that maybe Rakesh, even you don't know, even though I've known you for 40 years, that my dad used to contribute to, there's an Anatha Ashram, right, very close to our school, St. Anselm's, um, that my dad used to contribute to and would give food and money and stuff, because what they did was they took orphans in, and this program was that they would educate these people in a hostile environment. So they would live there, get educated, then go out to be successful citizens of this planet. Because education is the key to changing the outcome. Right? One of the challenges we face in India is just the lack of education or access to education. And, and if you could educate the masses better, the outcome of this country would go from $1,700 per capita GDP to, what did you say was the US, 58,000? Which I think is the highest on the planet. And, and, and only because of education it does that. Because entrepreneurs are not, you know, uneducated people. Yes, they may be dropouts from Harvard or whatever it is. But eventually, they're very, very smart people. They are people like you and me. They are people that have taken their education and come up with the idea how to capitalize on it. And so one of the things that I do uh, is I'm, in, I'm on the board of an organization called City Year. Uh, it is, it is a, uh, it's an NGO that is dedicated to um, bringing uh, the underprovished kids up to grade level in their school. So they focus on kids from third grade to tenth grade, and there's a lot of research done in the U.S. on this that if you don't show up to school, you fall behind. If you fall behind, which means you're not at grade level, you will never pass school. And if you never pass school, you end up in crime. And if you end up in crime, you become a burden to the society and to your family and to everybody else around you. 
and so the focus of this organization is to just work with these kids in school from third to tenth grade and once they are at grade level, once they are moving along the education system properly, they succeed and they actually become a contributor to the, to the society to raise the GDP, whether we compare India 1700 to the US 58,000 or there's a lot of countries that have, the GDP is even lower than 1700. I mean, India is, is a very developed country today. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the GDP was 20 years ago, but I'm sure it was very nominal. So, please do focus on your own education for the moment. Soon you will graduate from school, from college, uh, from your master's program. And as you become a successful entrepreneur, and as you go out in the world and make a difference, remember you should give back to the society. Now some religions dictate that. I know that the Muslim religion requires you to contribute 10% of your earnings back to the church, well, back to the, uh, to the mosque and then they uh, use it for benefit of the, uh, the community. Many other religions require that, similar setup. Hinduism doesn't. But whether you're a Hindu or a Muslim or Christian or whatever, I don't really care whether you believe in God or don't. Just do your part for the rest of the society. Because this society, we're social animals. This society is what brought us here. This society is what will help us today and tomorrow. And this society is what we are going to be eventually. And if we cannot help our brethren succeed, we ourselves are failures. So, I am committed to City Year. I've been on the board for now four years. And, and we also contribute a lot of cash just to further the cause because obviously all NGOs need money. So with that, I think I'm running out of time. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, my conversation will inspire at least some of you to become entrepreneurs, some of you to succeed better in life than what you had thought about. And, um, I don't think my my contact information is not there, but I'm sure you can get that very easily. If you Google Raghu Bhargava, it will show up on page one. Uh, and and um, feel free to get in touch with me. But above all, please do not give up on your dream. I don't care what your dream is. Do not give up on it. The minute you give up, go in the backyard, take a gun, shoot yourself in the head. Because you don't deserve to live anymore in my mind. But if you don't give up on your dream, if you don't give up on your dream, one day you will be standing here instead of me, and people will be clapping for you, not for me. So thank you, and um, I think we have some time for questions. Yes. So he got this idea, and he turns into a zombie. He turns around, leaves the party, leaves the conversation hanging, goes to his dorm and starts coding. And that is your typical entrepreneur, guys. If you haven't seen that movie, go watch it. And there's another movie with, um, who's the lady from um, the, oh, I can't remember, Jennifer, Jennifer um, Lawrence. There was a movie about her, uh, or she's the, the actor in it, but uh, it's a movie about, uh, and I can't remember all the details right now, I'm sorry, but uh, it shows about how determined she is, this lady is, to succeed. And she gets turned down every single place she goes. And she, they, had, they had invented this mop, uh, you know, to, to clean the floor. And really, how many of us go to the market looking for a sexy mop? I mean, it's like something that, you don't think about it, correct? But you see that movie and you get the perspective as to how <coughs> driven people can be when they focus on the right thing. And if they believe in it. And so they're going to put her, uh, there's the, what's the TV channel that sells products online on, on the TV? Uh, yes, it's Shopping Network, correct? And they launch the product on the shopping network and it fails. They don't get a single call to buy it. 
and she convinces them that they should put her in the, on the TV. And she's like an average, mediocre-looking person, so they're looking like, hey, why would we put you on stage, and you know, you're not gonna make a good impression and stuff. Finally, they give in and they say, okay, here's the dress you're gonna wear. It's like sparkly with sequins and whatnot and stuff. And so they open the stage to launch the TV show, and it's all live, and she's dressed like a maid. And they're like, holy shit, this is gonna be a big flop. It was the biggest success. Because a lot of women think of, of themselves as maids at home when you're doing the cleaning, correct? We're all maids when you're doing the cleaning. And if she can change your life, you will buy her product. There is no two things. Where else are you going to go? And when you look at that, it changes your life. It changes your perspective on life. That is what entrepreneurs do. You believe in your product to the end level. And you can see it through the consumer's eyes. And you can sell it to them at that point. And they will buy. So, you know, it's a very long answer to a short question. I wish I had a list of three people that I, care, I really admire. But I admire a lot of people. In fact, you all should admire every successful person on the planet. Because they all have their own story. It's a little different. It is different than my story. It is different than Rakesh's story. I mean, Rakesh, 20 years ago, you were doing something very different. In fact, Rakesh and I have some, something common in our, in our background. We were both dairy farmers. I mean, from being a, on a dairy farm milking cows and cleaning up the cow dung to now sitting here, standing in front of whatever, two, three hundred people and talking. It's a very different life. How do you get here? My story is very different than his, and his story is very different than mine. But we're both successful. Okay. And so find whatever works for you, whoever you like, and follow them, learn from them. I mean, how did Mahatma Gandhi succeed? He never gave up. He never gave up. He could have gone back to South Africa. I don't really care where he could have gone back to. But that was not an option for him. Any, anybody else? You too. Okay, go ahead, please. Good morning, sir. My name is Pooja Gupta. So, if there would be anything that you could change about your journey, what would it be? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I would have worn a tie today. It is so damn hot here. And, uh, no, all kidding aside. Yes, you know, we can look back to our life. And I'm sure we all have made mistakes that we think, hey, if I'd taken a right turn instead of a left turn or whatever it is, my life would have been better. But, and I used that term happy-go-lucky early on in my conversation. I am really a happy-go-lucky man, and I never look back. The only reason I look back is to learn from what I did that didn't result in a good answer, so that I can actually change the future may not make that same mistake twice. Outside of that, look, what has happened has happened. You really cannot go back and change it. So why dwell on it? <coughs> I mean, I, in my second year in college, I got a supplementary. You guys all know what a supplementary is, correct? I had to study the summer and then retake the exam and stuff. And am I really proud of it? No. But what could I have done to change it? Nothing. I just figured out, oh, I better study and get through this, otherwise I will fail. And I will be stuck in second year while all of my classmates will move to third year. That was an unacceptable answer. So think about what to learn from it and how to change it versus trying to dwell on the past and saying, oh, let's not take that turn. Well, you already took it, man. It's too late to worry about it. You're already on the highway of heaven or hell. Figure it out, how do you get on the right track? And some people want to live in hell and that's fine with me because I'm not trying to control their life. Some people like me want to live in heaven and I'm not complaining about it. I have a very, very good life. I think 
I live with what I call a million dollar lifestyle. And Rakesh and I last night you know, were talking about some of the stuff that just happened in the last two, three days in my life. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details. But I live a million dollar lifestyle. I would not change it. I would not change a thing. Though my wife might say she wants a better husband. <laughs> Anybody else? I saw some other hands. Just one here in the front. Good morning, sir. As you bolded about the negativity uh, in your session right now, uh, we go on further, means many hurdles we face in our life. But the word patience, which is lost at every moment, at every step of our life, whenever we are means thinking about further, and how that patience can be kept in ourselves, and we can like know there is there are things which could be uh, means make ourselves life better and much better going further. Yeah, you know, I think you've asked the wrong question to the wrong person. Because I tell my kids, patience is a virtue your father does not have. Okay. <laughs> this is why I drive fast. <laughs> because for me. Driving is just a means of getting from here to there. If I could do the Star Trek thing, beam me up Scotty, I would just do it. Because why would I waste my time? How, much, how many hours did we spend coming from Delhi to here yesterday? I woke up at 4 o'clock and I got to the guest house at like 4.30. 12 and a half hours. Okay? Imagine if I could get that in 30 seconds. So patience is not something I bring to the table. So I'm the wrong person to ask that question. But yes, does not mean that you have no patience. It just means that you are an impatient man, or I am, okay? And, and yes, there's a lot of negativity. So yesterday I had to charge my phone in the guest house, and I, I start to plug in the thing. And you know, the, the, you guys are all familiar with this struggle, correct? Right? It's a three-pronged plug but you have a two-pronged thing and won't go in because the third thing needs to be pressed and stuff, right? And how do you do it? I mean, you're not going to stick your finger in there. I mean, other than if you have a death wish. So I reached into my computer bag. I had a three-pronged thing in it for my computer. I turned, took it out, turned it around, stuck it. And there's three people witnessing him. Ajay is one of them. And I told him, this is attitude. Correct? Because there's negativity. You start your conversation with the Word. comment about negativity. Correct? There is negativity everywhere. Correct? If I drink too much of this, well, I need to take a break. If I don't drink enough, I can talk. I mean, think about it. There's negativity everywhere. But it's how you deal with it. Correct? And you have to, as an entrepreneur, and forget an being an entrepreneur, as a human, when you get out of this hall and you're walking, going home, what if, if you took the bus and it fails? What if you drove and the car doesn't start? What if you bite and there's a flag? A seven zillion things could go wrong. How are you going to deal with it? And that is what determines who you are. Figure it out fast. Because life is passing by. It's in the very, very fast lane. It's going 300, 300,000 miles an hour, something like that. Correct? I mean, we're spinning at 24,000 miles an hour on this planet. Okay. And if you slow down, we would all get thrown into space. So the Earth cannot slow down. So you have to keep pace and you have to think on your feet. You have to make it happen. And the three people in the room yesterday, are all three of you in the audience here? I know you are here, Ajay. There was Pooja and Kajal with me last night. Are they here? Okay, they're outside. But you guys know who these people are, maybe not, but Ajay, raise your hand so that you can all see him and ask him how fast that reaction was to fix that problem with the charging of the phone. Because we don't have time to think about this. And that is what happened for Kuya. How much time do we have, guys? I don't want to overstay my welcome. Okay, I have permission, so maybe a few more. Oh, very good morning, sir. I'm Shishma Pandey. And I would like to ask you the question that uh, you said we should dream about our future. Yes. So had you any futuristic view that what position you have attained today? Like you were born in a silver spoon family 
you were brought up well and had you thought that you would influence the lives of so many people? Never. Never did I have that dream. In fact, Rakesh, why don't you come up and answer that question? <laughs> I gave you an answer last night, correct? I'll, I'll give you, I'll just give you a couple of examples of... I know, you will go and I'll pay attention. I'll give you maybe one example of my lifestyle. So, growing up in Ajmer in India, you know, I think, I think our house was like maybe 1,500 square feet. If I can use the square feet term, bear with me, I don't know all the conversion and stuff. But, and uh, how many of us were there? Well, there were my parents, I had two sisters and myself. So there's five of us in about 1,500 square feet, right? Today there's two of us, my wife and I, and we live in 6,000 square feet. We have, uh, that's what, uh, five times two is, we have 10x the space to ourselves. She could be in the east wing, I could be in the west wing, I would need a phone to call her. Okay. Did I ever dream of going from 1500 square feet to 6000 for the two of us versus the five of us? No. But, and, and some of that is happy go lucky, but some of it is making the most of what you have. Because opportunities are staring at us in the face all the time. I ran into one, what's the name of the guy that was in, the, in your office this morning? I'm sorry, I did not ask his name, but there was some guy who walked in and he showed me a quick video he had done in the last 24 hours. Um, Ayush, Ayush, Ayush. Ayush, are you there, Ayush? Okay, he might be outside or something, but, but he walked in and he showed me a video he had developed um, on his phone and two things came in my mind one is wow that is one talented guy second how can I partner up with somebody like that to do some videos for us okay and so the happy go lucky says okay whatever nice we go move on I'm not here to look at that, that thing I've got something else on my agenda correct I was going to come in here and talk to you guys but you have to seize that opportunity at all times. And that's where you change that happy-go-lucky to say, what am I seeing, what is staring in my face, and how can I capitalize on it? And I actually called my director of marketing in the US, it's 8.30 when I called her, 8.30 p.m. her time. And I said, I want you to send me this information, I want to share it with Rakesh, and I want to build a relationship where your college and Global Upside are going to work together on some projects. And that is, that is opportunity, correct? That is what you're shooting for. Thank you, sir. Way in the back. Good morning, sir. My name is Anshujan. And I want to ask you a question that what kind of an important mantra would you like to give the future entrepreneurs like us? I think I already gave that one out, which is believe in our dream and don't ever give up. I've actually had many people come and sit in my office for advice. This is back home in Silicon Valley. And, and the one advice that you, that you should never let go is do not give up on your dream. It's your dream and yours alone. I have no idea what your dream is. And honestly, I could care less what your dream is. Because it's your dream, not my dream. You want my help, I will help you. Or maybe I won't. Because I don't believe in your dream or I don't like his approach. Lots of factors, right? But there's a lot of factors that can force me to help you. So convince people about your dream and don't give up on it and they will come through and help you. It may not be me. It may not be anybody in this audience, but there is somebody out there who believes in you. Somebody who cares about you. Might be your parents to start off. In fact, let me tell you a little story about entrepreneurship and Germany. So in Germany, in, in a lot of countries, I come from Silicon Valley. You can fail five times and people will still give you money to go do your sixth venture. 
And you just lost $100 million of people's money and they're willing to give you more money. In Germany, it is the opposite of that. So if you, as an entrepreneur, you go to the bank and say, look, I've launched this company. I think I need a $100,000 or 100,000 euro line of credit so I can have some working capital to run my business and stuff. And this guy, I was on a panel with him and he's standing there and he's saying, I went to the bank, I gave them the story and I need a line of credit. And the guy asked me, tell me about your family history. And he said, oh, my father, he worked for blah, blah, blah. Let's just call them Siemens, a big German name, correct? And they're well established, they're retired, they have this big house in the country and all that stuff. And hey, I have a small little apartment that I rent and I live here and I'm working on this. He said, so why don't you ask your parents to collateralize your, their house and give you the money? Because the bank is unwilling to give him a loan. Where does that entrepreneur go? He has no choice left. He actually moved from Germany to the US and today, at that point when I was on the panel with him, he had about 350 people working for me, for, for him, I'm sorry, and, and he was building a business. Okay. And so, some guy in the valley is willing to believe on it, some guy in India is willing to believe on you, some guy in this planet is willing to believe in you. May not be me, may not be somebody else. But if you give up on it, like I said, go in the back, pull out a gun and shoot yourself in the head, because you're not worth living. Do not give up on your dream because that is the only one thing that is very, very unique to you. And you're the only, you're the champion of it. You give up on it, what do I care? <coughs> correct? I don't, I don't even remember your name. You just mentioned it five minutes ago, correct? Thirty seconds ago. That's how much I care about you. And by the way, I'm not trying to make grades. The caring from the teacher dropped because now you're an adult. You are responsible for your own future. Why are you looking at me? I'm just here to impart knowledge. I'm not going to hold your hand. It's not in my job to hold your hand. How many bag, what's your bag size here, Rakesh? 60, 60, right? So every year 60 new students are going to come in. Every day these teachers teach about 140 kids. How much time do they have for each one or any one? You raise your hand and you convince this teacher that I want to be the best HR professional and she says she believes in you, she will help you get there. And all the other 119 kids, they could be failures in HR and she would care little about it. It is your dream, don't give up on it. I cannot tell you guys enough about it. I cannot repeat it. Repeat it every single night before you go to bed. It is my dream. This is my dream. I will not give up on it. Wake up and do the same thing. Write it on the damn wall above your bed. Write it everywhere you sit, everywhere you see it. Here is my dream. This is what brought me to building Global Upside. This is what brought me to where I am today. This is my dream. I am not going to let it fail. I don't really care who it is on this planet. Rakesh and I were sitting last night and I'm sorry to keep bringing up this dinner last night but I took two phone calls because it is my dream and my life depends on it. I have a very, very capable team working for me in the US. I'm not going to let them ruin my dream even for a second. And I hope you get the passion in my voice. I hope you get the attitude in me. Because that is all that supports my dream. Because if I am not intelligent enough, I need to rely on other people. If I am intelligent enough, I still need to rely on other people because how many clients can I service? One, five, fifteen, then what happens? Correct? Right? So your dream is only your dream. It is built upon you. Its success is built on the social structure that you have. You want to include me in it? Include me in it. You don't want to include me in it? No worries. <laughs> but, and look, this is not, I'm not trying to push myself on you. All I'm saying is, believe in it and find the people that will help you get there. Because you will not be able to do it by yourself. I wasn't able to do it by myself. Even Mark Zuckerberg wasn't able to do it by himself. Steve Jobs couldn't do it by himself. Take anybody. Do you know who, who is the richest person on the planet right now? How many of you know that? I'm sorry? 
All of you are wrong. You guys have no idea what's happening out there. Go read the paper. Go figure it out. Anybody has access to Google? Google right now. Figure out who's the richest person on the planet. Exactly. She knows the answer. She knows the answer. It's Jeff. How many of you know who Jeff Bezos is? Exactly. Guys, Bill Gates sat on top of that throne for a very, very long time. He's no longer on that throne because somebody came and kicked his butt. Correct? You could be one of those guys. You just have to believe in it. So. Thanks a lot for sharing your great news. Oh, you're welcome. Takesh, let me know when you need to stop because it's 11.36. I think I'm overstaying my welcome. <laughs> Hello, sir. So yes. You said that you had only $5 in your pocket. So yes. How did you enroll in any college? Yeah, see, remember I also talked about my dream and supporting my dream? So I had to borrow money from my brother because the college doesn't care a damn about it. Did, did the institute say, oh, come on in. You can pay me whenever, some other day, correct? Okay? I actually got government loans, I got grants. The university had a program because, in, in, you know, the system in the U.S. is a little bit different. I don't know how many of you understand that, that aspect of the U.S. system. But uh, your enrollment for the next year is dependent on uh, your seniority and a lot of other factors. The university that I went to had a program that if you volunteered and worked in the office for X number of hours, you, would, you were allowed first priority in enrollment for the next year. I did that. Why did I do it? I could not afford to stay one extra day in college. I completed a four year degree in three years. When you are young, what you have is a lot of energy. When I was young, I had the same thing, a lot of energy. You have very little experience. So nobody is willing to give you a job, maybe. Nobody is willing to pay you millions of dollars. So your time is the cheapest it is ever going to be in your life. As you mature, hopefully you become smarter. Hopefully your worth goes up. So if somebody offered me a job at one dollar an hour today, I would just turn it down. Because I think I'm worth a million dollars an hour. And I can make that money. But 30 years ago when I was starting in college, my time was very, very cheap. A one dollar an hour job, I would take it any given time, any given day. Because that was more money than anybody else was willing to pay me. So, what you do is when your time is worth very little, you work very hard to get that experience going. Once you have that experience, then you can get to the next level. And that's, and it is not about how much money you have. Correct? Because how far does five dollars go? I mean, if any one of you had five rupees, or even if you multiply it by 60 and say five, that's uh, 300, uh, you know, rupees. How far, I mean, you could only buy yourself maybe lunch, okay? And so, um, it's not enough money to do anything. It wasn't enough money to do anything 30 years ago when I went to the U.S. But what do you do? You have that social structure, right? And you capitalize on it. And somebody believes in you. That's the same story I told him. Okay. Somebody will believe in you and they will say, oh yeah, here is $10. And then some other guy says, you're familiar with the crowdsourcing concept, right? Uh, crowdsourcing, that's what you're doing. We call it crowdsourcing, but in India it's always has been known as the social structure. Do you know why the divorce rate in India is so low? Because everybody's involved in your marriage. From your neighbor, to your parents, to your kids, to your Correct? They cannot let you get a divorce. Because everybody says, Rakesh, what's going on? How can I help you? Sorry, I know you're not going through it. But, you know, everybody wants to help you succeed. It's social structure. Correct? This social structure doesn't exist in developed countries. That's why the divorce rate is high. So if I, if I was in India and I lost my job, what would happen? I would move in with my parents and live with them for till I found another job. 
In the US, I lose my job. The bank calls me and says, you've got to vacate the house, man. You're mortgaged. The car company, the car loan company or the bank calls and says, you need to turn in your car. You haven't made a loan payment. The stress factor is here. But there is no social structure, correct? It is all a commercial. I love capitalism, don't get me wrong. I am a capitalism to the, to the end, correct? I am a capitalist, I'm sorry. And, and I believe in it. That is what allows me to do, look like this, do what I want to do, travel like that, whatever, have a million dollar lifestyle. But you have to contribute to it to get it back. Sorry. And, and so build your social structure and that's how you succeed. Thank you, sir. Sorry, man. Well, thank you all.